Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kanika and uh, uh, this is a short walk and I know it's a hot and a very very humid day. It's practically still and we all wish for a breeze. Uh, it's a short walk, it's not a great walking distance and we should be done in less than two hours time, just a little less than two hours. And uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a brief background to, in terms of what to expect here, what is this place about and also connect it with the rest of Delhi's history so that there's always a connecting point and this is not standing out in isolation. And then as we move on, we talk about the specific monuments we see. There aren't very many, there's there actually you can eat three monuments here. Yeah. But they are very, very interesting. One of the few, one of the lesser known monuments uh, in the city and lots of interesting stories about them. And as we go on, I'll try and highlight, not only highlight these stories, but also avoid names and dates. There aren't too many and you're not expected to remember them. So I'll keep it as simple as possible. In any in in case I'm not clear, please feel free to ask. Stop me, ask me to repeat. Whatever you think is appropriate. And if you have anything to add to what I'm saying, you're most welcome to do so. Feel free to comment, make your own guesses of what this is. And you know, so it's, all, it's an open field. Yeah, it's not an exam. Um, okay, in terms of a background to this place, uh, the fortress, the place we are visiting, is Kotla Feroz Shah. And the name itself, uh, suggests that it's a small fortress. Kotla or Kot is a word for a small fort-like thing. And the fact that it is named after Feroz Shah, Kotla Feroz Shah, is due to the fact that Feroz Shah was the person responsible for creating this. Yeah? He built this place as part of his capital city. Now, the city doesn't really exist anymore. Whatever is left, whatever we are going to explore today, is only a very, very small part of that city, the capital city which he had built. And it's in fact only a little bit of his citadel. Those of you who have been subject to in the Indian education system, we would all remember how we were forced to learn about the Harappan civilization and the citadels and the lower city there. Yeah? So this is actually the citadel, which is left of the capital city of Feroz Shah. And a citadel typically is a very, very exclusive space. Yeah, it's the most secure, most uh, well guarded, and the most exclusive uh, enclave within a larger city. This is where the royalty lives. This is where the treasury might have been, and this is the place which is expected to have the most monumental, most grand uh, buildings, in, rather than the rest of the city. Yeah? So we are lucky that little bit of this survives, and as we go on, I'll try and uh, share with you how and what, how these monuments have changed, what they were like and what has become of them now. Now most of, a little bit of this area is mostly just walls and piles of stones here and there. And as we start, I start the walk by trying to convince you that there's something really, really exciting about that pile of stones. Yeah? <laughs> but as we go on, uh, there are more monumental structures which where which is some very, very specific stories attached to them. And we'll talk more about it as we go on. Okay? Please come. In terms of a background to Firozabad, now Fi Kotla Firoz Shah is not its real name. It's not its original name. Uh, we call it Kotla Firoz Shah, which is pretty, I think, a fairly modern one, probably late 19th century, early 20th century name. Earlier, its original name was Firozabad. And the, the reason, the logic for naming it Firozabad is simply because Firoz Shah built it, so he decided why not name the city after himself. Like this is what most kings end up doing. So you have Ahmedabad, which is named after Ahmed Shah. You have Shah Jahanabad, which is today the old city, old Delhi for us, named after Shah Jahan. 
and many many more. We have Tuklakabad named after the first Tuklak king. So kings typically do this. They, they create a city and they name it after themselves. Yeah, this is the best way to show off your power. Yeah. And to stake claim to, yes, this is my city. My descendants better not try and you know, <laughs> stake claim over it. So usually what happens, um, you, you pick up any book on Delhi yeah, or even a guidebook. It will tell you that Delhi has seen many, many cities over a very long pe period of time. So almost for say a thousand odd years, there have been many cities of Delhi uh, which were built by different people, the different dynasties who came in, different rulers who each decided, each who had enough money and who survived long enough on the throne decided let's build a new capital city. Yeah? And Piroz Shah was one such king and he built this capital city in the second half of 14th century. Now Firoz Shah is part of the dynasty of the Tughlaqs. They, they are considered one of the most prominent medieval period dynasties who ruled in North India and they ruled from Delhi. But Firoz Shah, the chap we are concerned with, is nowhere, is hardly a, the most important person. He's the third in line. Yeah, so there have been two predecessors before him and there have been a couple of other kings after him as well. Now the two chaps before him, the first fellow was Ghiasuddin Tughla, the second was Muhammad Tughla. You don't have to remember the names, for, for the sake of simplicity I'll keep it as Tughla 1 and Tughla 2. Yeah? Tughla 3 is the one we are concerned with, Firoz Shah. Yeah? So Tughla 1 and 2 are really really grand personalities. Yeah? They, they are one um, when, when we read history, when you typically read history, they're all political histories. They talk about uh, grand warriors, they talk about uh, impressive kings who have who are either very brainy or have a lot of money or um, were very, very great warriors. So they're all great people or great failures. Yeah, so you don't have a middle path somewhere in typical political histories. Now, Piroz Shah's tragedy, uh, tra tragedy, uh, tragedy in um, history is that he's considered something of a uh, hopeless fellow. He's not somebody who you really uh, think of as a grand king. He's not somebody you think of as a king also. Yeah? His predecessors were really men of great valor. The first guy, Tughlaq I, made his reputation fighting the Mongols and killing them off en masse. Uh, the second fellow, Tughlaq II, uh, again a, one of the most talked about characters in Indian history. He's something of a mad genius. He came up with, uh, he's a brilliant man and he came up with ideas which were well ahead of his time. He's also a much hated man. He, he, he was into extremes, so one day he would be extremely generous to everyone the other day, you'd be chopping off everybody's limbs. So, but he was somebody you uh, you talk about even now. Firoz Shah, like I said, nobody paid him much attention. And his successors were also people who have been considered mostly insignificant. So nobody no remembers their name. So effectively speaking, Firoz Shah's reign is considered somewhat of a decline in Tughlaq glory and practically the end of the Tughlaqs. But Firoz Shah was much more than that. And he's one of the chaps I like in Indian history and I'm going to tell you why, but a little later as we go on. Now, the direction we are taking in this walk is that we're moving from the west towards the eastern edge of now, as we walk through, they are not very spectacular <laughs> monuments, you see. You are mostly seeing structures like these. These are gateways which don't lead to anywhere. So you are walking from one patch of land to another, interspersed with these gateways, some walls here and there. Uh, it's very hard to actually reconstruct what it was. But people who read this sort of stuff, their guess is that this is a series of courtyards. This is the palace area. and. What we see here is, as soon as we enter, we enter through a gateway which would have been guarded effectively, etc. And you walk through a series of courtyards which would have consisted of uh, the official area. So you, as you walk in, it gets more and more exclusive. So the first courtyard, and these courtyards are divided by gateways, gateways like these. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there's not much standing around. But these thick foundations you see, these are foundations of walls, gateways, which would have been along this east-west axis. And the idea was that 
as soon as you enter, you find a group of uh, government employees, people like scribes, watchmen, other government officials, and then you move on to the next courtyard, there'll probably be a few more senior officials, and then that would lead you on to the court of the king. It's not necessary the king held court here, but since we don't have any other evidence of where Firosha might have been, it's just a uh, it's a good guess, everybody, or a commonly accepted guess that this might have been the area where the palace was. And this guess is also based on the fact that other Tughlaq palaces in Delhi, mostly and particularly Tughlaqabad, uh, you find a similar pattern of a series of courtyards, each more exclusive than the other. So as you move in, you're moving into a more and more royal, exclusive and private space. Yeah? So this is what we see as we go towards the Eastern edge. is not for us to see today. It doesn't exist in form of a bound, you know, enclosed city. So Tuklakabad, you can see that, okay, there's a boundary wall within which the rest of the fort is. Or even in old Delhi, you have a main palace and you know the city existed around it. You, you still have a couple of gateways of the old city surviving. One is right here, the Delhi Gate. But in case of Pirozabad, the boundary wall doesn't exist. Can you all hear me over that chirping? Yeah. <laughs> So I'm constantly competing with dogs and birds and <laughs> maybe gins are next. <laughs> so for Firozabad, we don't have any boundary wall left. All you have is this little small tiny citadel, which is, uh, which is you know, all that you see around you, that's it. It's nothing beyond <laughs> this. It's a very, very small area for a capital city of somebody who had enough money to be able to do this. But we do get accounts of Firozabad. Most of our information of what Feroz Shah was up to and what was happening in his city comes from contemporary accounts. People who were at his court were writing about how grand he is even though he really wasn't. That's what kings do, yeah? They employ scribes and historians to write nice things about them. So that's typically what happened with Feroz Shah also. So there are people in his court who are writing about him. There are other people who uh, are writing histories of medieval of their time and they mention what, what they see around them. So most of our information about Firozabad actually comes from these accounts. And they tell us that Firozabad was a massive city. So the, the extent we are given is roughly from in North Delhi, the area where Delhi University is today. It's also known as the Northern Ridge. So from there you cover what is today old city, old Delhi. The area where Jama Masjid is, the area where you have Turkuman Gate, very close by, where you have a woman emperor's tomb, Razia's tomb. Then, of course, this area, the citizens. Then you go further south and towards Hoskhas. So that is a big chunk, even now, of NCR. It's, it's practically half of NCR, yeah, from north to south. So that is given as the extent of Firozabad. So you can imagine how big it might have been. But if you talk about who are the kind of people who lived here, how many people who lived here, it's pure guesswork. You really don't have much information. But you do get instances of people writing about how excited they were to see a new city. It's almost, the descriptions are almost like how excited Delhiites got when they first saw the metro. They all ran to see it and the metro had to be stopped or some operations really really fell apart simply because everybody in the city ran to see how it worked yeah? so something like that happened with Firozabad also uh, when this city was built there were older cities of Delhi so this is not the first settlement in Delhi yeah? the older cities of Delhi were at a place uh, what is today South Delhi where you have the Saket Malls where you have the Kutub complex uh, Sarvoday in clay that area and it was Jahapana. It was called Jahapana. It was the former capital. So the old Delhi was there in the south area. And when the new capital opened, it's all new, brand new and shining and clean. It's 
so everybody is actually coming here uh, for picnics yeah so they actually describe how people uh, the entire distance between the older city and the new one is full of people and it's almost like a fair like a mela and they describe that how every few steps there are people selling food on stalls they, they describe the fair in palanquins they describe the fair in ca horse drawn carriages they describe the fairs uh, in other mo means of transport mules etc so very very vivid descriptions of how excited pe people were to see this city and i'm sure they had a good reason too because firoz shah is known for his building activities so when his historians write about him they don't say that oh the king is not that great they say he uh, of course if this did that then the heads would be chopped off <laughs> so they they say things like uh, firoz shah has three main interests they say it's governing it's hunting and it's building he doesn't care about anything else doesn't care about politics too much but yes governance a uh, welfare state hunting of course it's, everybody likes a grand hunt and building and firoz shah himself has left a set of memoirs his own writings apparently and there he describes in detail all these activities his hobbies and we're going to talk a little more about them as we see some more structure okay. yeah. Well, the guard outside, we were talking to him once we arrived, and he said that yes, he could feel them. He is on night duty often, so he said that yes, he could feel some sort of presence here. <laughs> I come in the daytime, and of course, it's only me here. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if I'm scared of the jins. <laughs> jins don't do overtime anyway. Yeah, yeah. So and sometimes jins are not scared of. Well, jins are scared of Kanika. So, so <laughs> they don't uh, come. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's me only mostly me haunting these ruins not many other people yeah but yes it has a lot of um, sanctity for a very large population they they come here in hundreds to offer oh, yeah. yeah yeah you'll see much more as we go towards those structures over there you'll see much more you might even find some people praying sometimes people who seem to have been possessed by some sort of a spirit come here either to tame that spirit or to make it go off 
whatever your concern <laughs> might be. <laughs> yeah. Is there like a darga or some religious? Uh... No, it's not a darga. You know, you see that pole jutting out. Yeah. Over there, yeah. That's, That's considered to be the main jinn. Yeah, it's the lat baba. Now, uh, lat is a staff, a walking stick. Yeah, lat. And baba is any any revered person, any person who has some sort of a morality and is respectable enough. He's called baba. It's a very very. Uh, it's a very typical term in North India. So that's the Lat Baba. He's the main jinn, but there are his subordinates around. So you are free to pray to anyone you like. So whoever is most uh, charming, you are most welcome to <laughs> offer something to him. And there are cats around, and you you see, uh, you see people who have left messages. As we go on, you'll see that they're, they're, they're tied up stuff. There is incense they have offered. <coughs> there are lamps burning. And there are pieces of paper on which people have left messages, requests for the jinns, and they cover a whole variety. It's not some high, it's not necessarily some high crisis which has to drive people to jinns. It could be something as simple as desire for victory for a neighborhood cricket team, yeah. <laughs> or of course, more deeper crises like there's a crisis in the family, it could be a financial crisis, a mental illness of a family member, somebody is missing, some, some people think their husbands have gone mad, so they want to drive sense into them, so all kinds of requests. We have all kinds of problems and we need the solutions, don't we? So people come here and offer their prayers and request for solutions to all sorts of things here. If you come here on a Thursday, the entry is free, that's one incentive. And secondly, you'll see that uh, it's free primarily because that's the chosen day for meeting the jinns. So people <laughs> come here in huge numbers. They also offer food to the needy. There's the whole lots of, you'll see homeless people also here who are waiting for uh, to be offered food by people who come in. And they do that as an act of charity. Yeah? They distribute food. So you'll see hundreds of people all around, on every road, every wall, everywhere you'll see people. It's amazing how this place transforms. On the first day of the month? Thursdays. Thursday. Every Thursday. And there's a small market where we met near the meeting point. So it's a very, very busy day. And of course, for people like me, the big incentive is that entry is free. So as a student, anything free is good. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this part where we, we trudged through a, a bit of grass to get here, this is, and you realize that this is slightly higher ground than where we were before. Uh, this has been identified as the palace area, and this is on the, would have been on the edge of the river. So, this is the edge. On the sunny side, just beyond this wall, is the edge which would have been built along the river Yamuna. So, where you see the ring road today, this is the patch of ring road you see. That way is ITO and the road leads on to Rajghat and the Red Fort area. So this this is where the river would have been. Now it has shifted course, it's moved further east. You can't see it anymore. But that was the original path of the river. So this is uh, one of the capital cities of Delhi which was built along the river. The others were Old Fort and of course Shah Jahanabad, what is today the Red Fort area. These are all capital cities built along the Yamuna. Of course, the Yamuna doesn't exist there anymore, so the, only the ruins are left. So, typically when you build something which is far off from the main gate and on an area which is not only on a higher ground, but cut off, the access on the other side is cut off, it typically means that it's the most exclusive area. And this has therefore been identified as the palace and people have also guessed this, that this might have been the area where women lived. Now, there's no specific evidence to tell you that, okay, this is the room where the, the queen might have stayed. Nothing of that survives anymore. As you can see, it's practically fallen down. It's only huge foundations you see and some random stones lying here like this, which indicate that these are actually pillar bases. You see these huge slabs of granite? These are bases for pillars. And also, if you see at the walls, and these huge squares which seem to be everywhere these are not just random squares these are all what is left of walls and pillars and as you can see these are massive these are not thin walls these are huge and this is typically how the Tughlaqs built they're built like giants 
the architecture is not known for some nice delicate work you you visit red fort you visit the taj mahal we appreciate the delicate work done there we appreciate the contrast in red sandstone and white marble we appreciate the precious stone inlay done on the marble so very very nice patterns how realistic they were but tughlaqs you don't see that you see these huge massive stone masonry and it's quite blunt it's quite stern yeah it's not pretty they are of course spectacular but in a different way and this is how the tughlaqs built to visit tughlaqabad which is another one of the capital cities built by the tughlaqs it's the same uh, sense of awe from the sheer fact that it is massive it's not pretty it's massive yeah and that's how the tughlaqs built another feature which is characteristic of tughlaq architecture is that it has sloping walls it's not very evident here this one yeah that yeah. wall over there um sloping out that wood. edge which is standing out that wall is slightly inclined mm -hmm. it's called batter so these walls are not perpendicular to the ground they have a slight angle and tughlaqs <coughs> typically built like this so if you see a random building standing can't identify it and if you see sloping walls it's a very very good guess that this is a tughlaq building so it's that's the most easy way to identify a tughlaq building okay come